And now for our fifth presentation, we'd like to welcome the York School from Monterey, California. Uh, hello, my name is Anushka Vliko Shopko, and uh, hello, my name is Jachin Tom Liu. We're from York School, and today we're going to be making a presentation on the rise and fall of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and the continuation of conflict between the United States and the Russian Federation. An aggressor should know that vengeance is inevitable; that he will be annihilated, and we would be the victims of the aggression. We will go to heaven as martyrs, and they will just drop dead. They will not even have time to repent for this. Vladimir Putin, 2019. The idea of mutually assured destruction that Putin is referring to has run at the forefront of the minds of Russians and Americans alike since the early days of the Cold War. In fact, my mother, as a child growing up in the Soviet Union, was instructed to hide underneath her desk if warnings signaling a nuclear attack came. The strategy ensures that in the event of a nuclear attack from the United States or Russia, the other will counter the assault. In the eyes of the Soviet Union, the catastrophic events uh, against humanity that took place in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 marked America as a country that was capable of dropping nuclear weaponry in a time of crisis. The United States, on the other hand, was well aware of its adversary's cache of nuclear weaponry and duly noted its increased production of nuclear arms. From the mid to late 20th century, the prevalence of nuclear weaponry in these two countries rose to staggering heights, peaking in 1986. With the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in 1987, however, each country agreed to destroy a set amount of missiles and enter a supposedly permanent period of no nuclear nonproliferation. As you can see on this graph right here, the number of, number of nuclear weaponry uh, increases steadily, reaching a height in 1986. As the number of nuclear arms began to decrease with the signing of the treaty, the threat between the United States and the Soviet Union began to lessen finally seeming to come to a period of peace with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the subsequent end of the Cold War. However, before the creation of this treaty, the threat of nuclear war was alive and well. With American bases on the border of Turkey and newfound Soviet bases in Cuba starting in 1959, each country had strategic firing points. The tension these bases created came to a head in 1962 when the director of the CIA, John McCone, was notified of the arrival of medium-range missiles with ranges of 600 to 3,400 miles to Cuba from the USSR. In response, President John F. Kennedy put out a warning to Russia and established a quarantine that blocked off Cuba from the Soviet Navy. In a letter to Nikita Khrushchev, Kennedy stated that America would not allow nuclear weapons to be delivered to Cuba and that the USSR needed to destroy its Cuban base and remove all the delivered weapons from the area. As you can see here, uh, a base in Cuba would be able to hit many major U.S. cities. The Soviet Union responded by deeming the quarantine an act of war. After several days of uncertainty, in a letter to Kennedy, Khrushchev wrote, if there is no intention to doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war, then let us not only relax the forces pulling on the ends of the rope, let us take measures to untie that knot. We are ready for this. Later, Khrushchev stated that America would have to remove its weapons from Turkey before the USSR would agree to Kennedy's proposal. Kennedy agreed, but insisted on keeping the agreement secret. Khrushchev called for the withdrawal of Soviet missiles from Cuba under American supervision in 1962, and Kennedy removed the US Jupiter missiles from Turkey in 1963. Dean Rusk, the, States, the United States Secretary from 1961 to 1969, described the Cuban Missile Crisis as the most dangerous crisis the world has ever seen. Just 20 years later, the United States simulated a nuclear attack in Abel Archer 83. Clearly, the near-war experience in 1962 did not extinguish the conflict between the two countries. After years of conflict, the two countries were pushed to resolve their differences at the risk of uh, nuclear holocaust. With Geneva as their backdrop, the two world powers began negotiation discussions, which took place in 1986. International instability motivated U.S. President Ronald Reagan and Soviet General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev to sign the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in 1987 in Washington. In the United States Senate, the treaty was ratified with a vote of 93 to 5.
The treaty was split into four parts and included a 16-page clause reg in regards to the elimination of missiles, 21 pages dedicated to the inspection of missile reserves, and 73 pages on the exact location and number of missiles each country had in its possession that were to be eliminated. With a total range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers, the extensive treaty's main purpose was to destroy ballistic missiles of the intermediate range, shorter range, and ground-launched cruise missile calibers. However, air and sea-launched cruise missiles were not included in this treaty. As opposed to air and sea-launched missiles, uh, ground-launched missiles followed this flight sequence. According to the agreement, LRINFs, or long-range intermediate nuclear forces, were meant to be destroyed within three years, and the short-range missiles needed to be destroyed within 18 months. To eliminate these weapons, the two countries were permitted to burn, cut, and detonate the missiles. While this treaty didn't cover all weapons of mass destruction, it did forbid the two countries from owning, manufacturing, or testing the weapons described in its clauses. Most importantly, the treaty was to be honored until it expired, which was whenever either country backed out of the accord. With inspectors to check each country's compliance of the treaty and the everlasting nature of the agreement, it seemed as though the unstoppable force of nuclear warfare had begun to lose momentum. As you can see here, the number of nuclear weapons steadily decreased after the signing of the treaty in 1987. However, as hello, test, there we go. However, as years have passed, a number of issues have arisen with this treaty, even with the presence of satellite photography, human inspections, and electronic intel back. intelligence inception. It was extremely difficult for the two countries. Back to the two. Let me do it. Don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. Don't worry. It was extremely difficult for the two countries to confirm the exact number of ballistic missiles, missiles each had in the possession. The NF Treaty uh, is cited as having one of the most comprehensive nuclear weapon inspections clauses. However, there is no solid proof mechanism to ensure adherence to the treaty's rules. In addition, many weapons that weren't listed in the treaty later came into existence. For example, the Soviet Union shortly began to pr the production of SS-25s, Small missiles that are in invisible to satellites, and the SCUD-8, a missile with a 300-kilometer range, with multiple violations of the treaty, including the testing of treaty-breaking missiles in 2017, Russia has been out of compliance for many years. The United States has also been accused of not following the treaty. In 2016, with assembly of Aegis Ashore, American, Bu American European Missile Defense System, Russia accused the U.S. of non-compliance. Not to mention, America's usage of military drones known as the Predator and Reaper, and President Donald Trump's 2017 funding of $25 million worth of cruise missile, further proves that the United States was out of compliance as well. With, many, with any steps being called uh, out as a violation of the agreement, it seems that just before 2019, the two countries carefully watched each other's action with nuclear weaponry. Even though this treaty was meticulously constructed from peace, to form peace, a mutual trust never to fully took place between the two countries. Referring to the Russia's multiple infringement on the treaty, the United States suspended the INF Treaty on February the 1st, 2019, while Russia did the same following day. As the United States and Russia do, uh, delve into a nuclear arms race, it is important to consider the attempts as, uh, at reconciliation each country has made. While Russia was found to be out of compliance by the U.S. State Department in 2014, Vladimir Putin at the Munich Security Conference specifically requested that INF Treaty to be modified to protect, protect Russia and the United States against other countries that weren't part of the treaty. At the time of INF's treaty was signed in 1987, Russia and the United States were essentially the only two nuclear powers of the world. Yet, as the time went by and each country destroyed their inter intermediate range nuclear forces, world powers such as China emerged and entered the international sphere of nuclear weaponry. With Putin's request of inclusion, the inclusion of more countries falling of deaf ears, it seems as though each country, each nation, trapped themselves in an impossible scenario. Even if they either destroy all of the nuclear weapons with the compromise of their own national security, or they have 
or they stick to their, uh, or they make treaty breaking nuclear weapons. In an attempt to resolve the issue without leaving the treaty, Trump introduced a three-step program in December 2017. In his response to Russia, he wanted to one, develop, develop new inspection commissions and strengthen diplomacy, two, fund research in the creation of new ground launch uh, cruise missiles, and three, take retroactive as well as proactive actions against companies involved in the generations of Russia's missiles. This approach means to be bo both protect the United States from in the event of a nuclear attack, as well as keeping the international uh, relation in case the two countries resolve in the issues, apparently did not work as, as less than a year after, in to October 2018, the United States states its intent of leaving the INF Treaty, signing Russian non-compliance once again. Trump also took issues with China's cache of 500 to 500 kilometer range nuclear weaponry, the same, of, same range of weapons that Russia and the US no longer had due to the INF Treaty. Vladimir Putin reciprocated later in December with a proposal to organize a summit between the two countries. In Geneva, the site of the original summit of INF that stopped, sparked the treaty, the two countries met again and could not reconcile. Soon after, in January 2019, they met once again in Beijing and could not, uh, couldn't meet, uh, go to an agreement either. Although the treaty has been suspended by both the United States and Russia, as of February the 1st and 2nd respectively, it has not yet been officially disbanded. With withdrawal from the treaty in February 2019, the United States presented an ultimatum. Within the period of six months from the demise of the INF Treaty, Russia could either return to the compliance and the treaty will be reinstated, or stay out of compliance, which would result in the official termination of the treaty in the eyes of the United States. It is difficult to predict, predict the future, but now both countries have abandoned the diplom diplomatic route and take instead to actively going against the treaty. A solution seems distant. Entering 2019, the first year, Russia and America had no regulations on the possession of intermediate range nuclear missiles. The two countries have positioned themselves to enter an arms race analogous to the Cold War. The United States Department through 2019 has increased their nuclear force budget to around $50 billion per year. In response, Russia has also begun to produce arms such as intermediate range hypersonic missiles, which would have been previously banned by the INF Treaty. The INF Treaty was nothing short of revolutionary in its time. The presence of this agreement between the two countries effectively diminished the threat of nuclear war between the two and resulted in the destruction of countless weapons of mass destruction. From the United States, 859 missiles were destroyed, while the Soviet Union destroyed 1,836 missiles. However, no matter how comprehensive the document was considered, it still had numerous faults. By not including air and sea launched missiles in the treaty, Russia and the United States did not completely take part in nuclear non-proliferation. In 2018, Russia was estimated to have about 6,850 nuclear forces in its possession, with the United States falling close behind with a total of 6,450 nuclear arms. With these weapons still in the possession of each country, the threat of nuclear war was not extinguished. Not to mention, this treaty truly only included the two countries. Over time, other world powers have emerged, which are not included in this treaty. As the United States and Russia destroyed all of their intermediate range nuclear forces, other countries having no regulations set in place began to produce them. One of the main reasons cited for Russian noncompliance was the desire to keep the country protected in the case of a nuclear attack. It is clear to see that the INF Treaty, while effective in 1987, will likely be forgotten by Russia and the United States within the next six months, as Russia, re Russia reaches its deadline. With the urge to be the most powerful country in the world, Russia and the United States have realized that there nothing equates power like total control, like weapons of mass destruction. After constructing the narrative, we are left with three questions. If the treaty were to be revised in the coming months, would the terms of the treaty be strengthened? In response to the first question, we point out that while the INF Treaty has one of the most comprehensive nuclear weapon inspection clauses, air and sea launch missiles should be included in this treaty if it is to be truly comprehensive. We also point out that this 1987 bilateral treaty did not account for the advent of nuclear, new nuclear powers and that this must be factored into future revisions. Finally, we point out that the INF treaty relies on good faith and mutual trust, suggesting that the multi multilateral agreements with mechanisms enforcement are needed as a backstop in volatile times. 
Our last two questions are, could anything have been done to prevent the treaty's dissolution? And can anything else be done in the next four months to prevent its total collapse? The second and third questions we leave open for reflection and discussion. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you for that great presentation. I was just curious, are there any specific reasons why this withdrawal occurred in 2018 under the Trump administration, uh, whereas like allegations started er much earlier than that? Well, actually, in my opinion, I feel like uh, Having this treaty in place, even though there were many allegations of non-compliance, it was still better because there was like active laws against the creation of these nuclear weapons. I feel like the dissolution of this treaty is worse than having a treaty that is a bit broken. So I feel, uh, I, the reason, I don't know, maybe because uh, Trump maybe isn't as, I mean, he didn't think about the fact that uh, it's better to have a broken treaty than no treaty at all. Okay, thank you.